<clears throat> okay, we're just at about 10, so we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining from around the world. My name is Sabrina Welsh, and I'm the Director of Programs and Operations at the Human Vaccines Project, and I'll be your moderator for this webinar. The last week in the COVID vaccine space has been very interesting and gives us lots of reason to be hopeful that multiple COVID vaccines are going to be available in the next year. Both Pfizer and Moderna announced data from their phase three trials in the past week, and Pfizer just yesterday announced that they completed their case accrual. In the Pfizer trial, the primary efficacy analysis demonstrates that the vaccine was 95% effective against COVID-19 beginning 28 days after the first dose. 170 confirmed cases of COVID-19 were evaluated with 162 observed in the placebo group versus eight in the vaccine group. Moderna's mRNA-1273 vaccine also appears to be protective at 95% based on the interim analysis. And we'll know more, I would think, in the next week or so once they reach full case accrual. Initially, both companies estimated that the efficacy data would be available in the beginning of next year. But because of the surge of cases in the US, both companies were able to accrue cases faster and get a quicker read on how effective the vaccine candidates are. Again, this is a sobering reminder of the current state of the pandemic, both here in the US and globally. Today, we'll hear from a researcher who's been studying SARS for years before the COVID-19 pandemic began. And most recently, her lab is focused on investigating the therapeutic effectiveness of interferon treatment for Ebola virus disease and now SARS-CoV-2. Just a quick note before we begin, the information presented today includes some pre-published data that is currently under peer review. At the request of the author, we ask that you not reproduce or disseminate the data presented. This session will be recorded and available on our website and our social media channels for you to review. Today's speaker is Dr. Eleanor Fish. Dr. Fish is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiologists and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. Dr. Fish has received many international awards acknowledging her scientific achievements and has published more than 170 peer-reviewed scientific papers in international journals. Dr. Fish studies the interactions of cytokines, specifically interferons and chemokines, with their host pathogen interactions, oops, sorry, with the receptors in normal and diseased tissues and cells. One focus of Dr. Fish's research is the investigation of host pathogen interactions at the cellular and molecular level, specifically in the context of viruses and interferons. Her research activities span basic science wet lab research to small animal, animal models of disease and translating these findings to clinical utility. In today's lab meeting, Dr. Fish is going to talk about global virus outbreaks and using interferons as first responders. During the presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I'll ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after she's finished the presentation. We'll have about 25 minutes for discussion, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to ask your questions about the data presented today. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Eleanor Fish from the University of Toronto. So welcome, Dr. Fish, good morning. I'll um, stop sharing my screen. If you'd like to take over and show your slides, that would be great. And you are still on mute. <laughs> Just unmuting myself, and I've got Great. this glitch on my. Uh... Okay, got rid of that glitch. Um, That's always fun. <laughs> yeah, and uh, Max have this thing now that suddenly your uh, pointer can disappear. I have no idea why. Um, let me now proceed and. Um... Great, and we can see your pointer. Great. I'm just going to go to here and get rid of some of the stuff that I don't need to see. Um, <laughs> Bear with me. Um, one more second. All right, I'm now happy to start and thank you for inviting me to share some of the research that I've been involved with, specifically rated, related to SARS coronaviruses. So what my uh, topic this morning is going to focus on SARS coronaviruses, but uh, what I wanted to uh, at the outset uh, indicate that the notion of pandemics is really not um, new to us. Uh, you can see from this particular slide, there have been many outbreaks of many vir different virus uh, infections that have spread around the globe and can be considered as both uh, epidemics, outbreaks, and indeed pandemics. 
Um, I've highlighted a number here, whether it be chikungunya virus, which I would suggest is something we should keep our eyes open for, a West Nile virus, which we became aware of, which is now in the Northern Hemisphere, Zika virus, uh, yellow fever virus. Uh, most recently, um, we had Ebola virus in West Africa, um, a number of different virus uh, outbreaks. Indeed, HIV can, can be considered um, a pandemic with uh, more than 40 million people infected worldwide. But what we're going to focus on this morning are the coronaviruses. And certainly in 2002, we had SARS-CoV, which we've now called SARS-CoV-1, with over 8,000 cases worldwide and some 774 deaths. In 2012, we had Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is actually spread to a number of countries, uh, about 2,500 cases and 912 deaths. But most significantly, SARS-CoV-2 has had a massive footprint around the globe uh, with over with uh, 56,728,000 ,000 cases as of today and some 1,357,000 809 deaths. So the footprint of SARS-CoV-2 is huge globally and uh, certainly has permitted us to glean a lot of information about coronaviruses, um, how they infect, um, and uh, look at potential um, options for targeting for interventions. So our first line of defense against any and all virus infections is our innate immune response. And those first 24 hours those first days are absolutely critical and determine the outcome to that infection. And what I hope to convince you in the ensuing minutes is this is certainly dependent to a large extent on a type one interferon response. So as you are all aware, um, we have uh, in place a non-specific surveillance system of uh, pathogen pattern recognition receptors that allow us to identify molecular patterns uh, associated with pathogens. And whether these be toll-like receptors on the surface of cells, in endosomal compartments, or uh, helicases um, in cytoplasmic uh, areas, such as um, uh, the ones I've identified here, MDA5, RIGI, uh, or the NLRP system, there are a number of these pattern recognition receptors which allow us to recognize these molecular patterns. This invokes an incredible signaling cascade. And what I want to point out is that they all converge on the production of type 1 interferons, interferons, interferon alphas, and interferon beta. And why is that? It's because uh, interferon alphas and interferon beta have receptors, if not one and if not two, that are ubiquitously expressed. So every cell that has the potential to be infected by a virus, and there are many, when one considers this, whether it's the respiratory tract, uh, whether it's a cardiotropic virus, a hepatic virus, whether it's a virus that enters through the skin, uh, pretty much every cell in our body has the potential to be infected by a virus. So it's important that those cells express receptors that will respond to a biologic that will trigger um, inhibition of that virus. So interferon receptors are ubiquitously expressed on all cell types, and they invoke, once activated by the interferons, an incredible signaling cascade. Now we've learned for many years about the jack stat signaling cascade, but in collaboration with my colleague Leon Platanius uh, at Northwestern, we've elaborated and elucidated a number of other non-canonical signaling cascades associated with MAP kinases and the PA3 kinase pathway that are all involved to um, uh, invoke that interferon response, which results initially in histone modification, then the alteration, the transcriptional activation of genes, and I've listed a number of here that we know are associated with an antiviral response. And at the same time, interferons will signal such that there is a change in mRNA translation, so the rapid uh, production of those proteins that are involved in that antiviral response. 
So this scheme serves to illustrate that in addition uh, to the direct antiviral response uh, invoked by interferons, there are other responses. So that direct antiviral response, as I've mentioned, that invokes the transcriptional activation of a number of genes and their gene products, uh, will target many different facets of viral replication for all viruses, whether they be DNA viruses, RNA viruses, enveloped or not, and regardless of the cell type which they infect. So some of those gene products limit the ability of viruses to enter the plasma, the cell via the plasma membrane. They limit the ability of viruses to uncoat their envelope. They will degrade the viral DNA or RNA, or they will prevent the assembly of proteins to form the virion, and they will also prevent the egress of viral progeny. At the same time, if the viral burden is huge, interference will induce apoptosis of those cells. So there are direct antiviral effects which target many different stages of a viral replicative cycle. So as I've mentioned, uh, they will target all viruses. And at the same time, we have this ability of interferons to, which is often overlooked, their ability to activate an immune response. So interferons will uh, induce the recruitment via secretion of a number of hemokines at the site of infection of specific immune cell subsets that I've highlighted here. And they also will be involved of clearance of the viral infection, whether they be uh, CD8 positive uh, cytotoxic T cells, um, whether they be uh, macrophages, um, natural killer cells and neutrophils, they're all involved in uh, adding to this viral clearance. And at the same time, we've learned that interferons, type 1 interferons, specifically interferon beta, is very important to the polarization and activation of B cells to become antibody secreting. So the point of this is to reiterate that type 1 interferons are very pleiotropic in the context of their direct antiviral effects and their abilities to recruit and activate immune cells to clear virus. And now this brings us to the uh, heart of my lecture, which is talking about coronaviruses. And as I mentioned in 2002, uh, 2003 in, in Canada, um, we had this outbreak of SARS-CoV-1, um, which resulted at the end of the outbreak with some uh, 8,098 people infected worldwide and some 774 deaths. At the time of the outbreak, uh, there was no vaccines and no approved antivirals. In common with all the viruses that have co-evolved with us, SARS-CoV-1 encodes in its genome a number of factors that very specifically block an interferon response. And this again should inform us of the importance of interferons in viral clearance. And what I show you here are these factors, nonspecific protein uh, one and three, uh, open reading frame six and the, eight, um, the M protein. And they're involved um, differentially in inhibiting um, interferon production through IRF3 and IRF7 uh, binding. They limit um, interferon mRNA translation. And certainly there's been some data to suggest that they will inhibit the downstream signaling from uh, interferon binding to its receptor, very specifically in the context of STAT1 phosphorylation and its nuclear translocation. So cognizant of the importance of uh, interferon, certainly uh, in the context of this virus, which blocks its interferon production. At the start of the outbreak, we undertook some in vitro studies to look at the ability of uh, interferons and the treatment of choice, the drug of choice, ribavirin, um, that was being used. This is an in vitro study using uh, human lung cells. And what I show you is that with increasing concentrations of ribavirin, there is absolutely no inhibition of virus. However, when we used a novel synthetic interferon, and this is interferon alpha-con-1, and it is a consensus of all the 14 interferon alpha subtypes. So the interferon alphas are 165 
amino acids. It's a protein, 165 amino acid proteins. So at each point, at each amino acid uh, along that 165 amino acid stretch, we, we took the most frequently represented amino acid amongst the 14 and we generated a consensus interferon. Um, anecdotally, we've subsequently shown it's the most potent um, and um, it's uh, now available um, uh, clinically and has been approved. So this is, shows you that with increasing doses of interferon alpha-con1 up to 5,000 international units per mil, we see good inhibition, in fact, complete inhibition of virus, where up to 2,000 micrograms per mil of ribavirin, which is a massive dose, we see no inhibition of virus. So this prompted us to undertake a clinical study, not a randomized controlled trial, but a clinical study in one of the hospitals in Toronto during the outbreak. And um, the idea was to treat, the intent was to treat patients with interferon and compare that with standard of treatment at the time, which was corticosteroids. So patients had to be um, within 10 days of symptom onset. They had to have progressive radiographic deterioration over the preceding 48 hours, which involved more than 20% of their lungs and progressive deterioration of their respiratory status also over the preceding 24 hours. In the upper panel, I show you a series of chest X-rays from an individual who received only corticosteroids. And you can see that progressively from day nine of symptom onset, the, 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 this lung became more occluded, more opaque, and they had severe respiratory issues. Those patients that received interferon alpha-con1 from onset of symptoms uh, onwards, you can see that their lungs uh, progressively cleared. And in fact, if you look at time to 50% resolution of the chest x-ray abnormality with the interferon group, this was four days versus 11 and a half days uh, with the control group. We also looked at the effects of interferon on a number of, of clinical parameters. Uh, obviously, uh, because this is a respiratory disease, saturation, uh, oxygen saturation is, is important measure of lung function. And what I show you here is that those patients who received corticosteroids alone, their oxygen sat dropped. Usually around about 93% is when you'd start introducing nasal prongs, continuous flow, and as it progresses worse, you'd go to mechanical ventilation. And you can see with the interferon treated group, their oxygen sats remained uh, very good. Another measure um, of this disease of SARS um, was a spike in creatinine kinase. And it transpires that those patients who had severe acute respiratory distress syndromes had significant spikes in creatinine kinase. And again, I show you this, the uh, control group versus the interferon group, which did not have a spike in creatinine kinase. And in fact, when we subsequently looked at gene expression analysis of peripheral blood mononuclear cells of those patients who either did not receive um, uh, interferon or those who did, we observed an increase in a number of genes um, such as defensins associated with an interferon response, re reinforcing that the uh, better uh, resolution of disease was indeed associated with an interferon response. So now let's switch to SARS-CoV-2. So as I mentioned, there are some 56 million uh, cases right now around the world with over a uh, million, uh, 350,000 deaths. At this point in time, we know that type 1 and 2 pneumocytes, alveolar macrophages, and endothelial cells can all be infected by this virus, uh, whereas the fatality rate was pretty high with SARS-CoV-1, about 10%. Right now, the global fatality rate is about 2.7%. And certainly in jurisdictions where um, dexamethasone is being used now, that fatality rate is coming down. As I mentioned to you before, there are a number of uh, factors encoded in the genome of uh, these coronaviruses. In fact, there are, we, we know across all the coronaviruses, there are about 10 factors which limit an interferon response. 
For SARS-CoV-1, these are the ones identified, and for SARS-CoV-2, uh, these are the ones that are involved. And again, they're associated with, with uh, blocking interferon production. We also know that for those individuals who have any mutations in genes associated with an interferon response, or who have autoantibodies to interferon, or low serum interferon levels at the start of their disease, they are at higher risk of developing a severe disease. What I show you here is, is published work um, from Dr. Chu's group, where essentially he, he has uh, been able to demonstrate that the um, replication of SARS-CoV-2 is, is much higher, the replication rate, than uh, SARS-CoV-1. And these panels below reiterate again that there is a failure to induce a good interferon response, uh, whether it be to SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV-2, um, and whether this be looking at the interferon alpha response over time, the interferon beta response, or the type three interferon lambda response. So I just want to remind you again about this whole process of SARS-CoV-2 infection and the immune response associated with it. So in this upper panel here, I show you how the virus enters uh, the cell through ACE2 um, and sets up viral replication. And uh, at the outset, um, these alveolar macrophages will start to secrete chemokines, which will recruit a number of immune cells to the site of infection uh, with obviously the intent to clear the virus. And indeed, if there is a normal, healthy immune response, um, you get uh, appropriate uh, CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, macrophages clearing the virus. However, if there is an aberrant or failed immune response, then there is an excessive infiltration by monocytes, macrophages, and T cells. We observe a, site, a systemic cytokine storm, pulmonary edema and pneumonia, and widespread inflammation and multi-organ involvement. So that is the severe disease. So this is prompted um, looking at various stages of the virus life cycle um, and at the various clinical outcomes um, to see where there might be interventions. And, and we're all familiar with um, the strategy to, to block receptor with ACE2 inhibitors. We're familiar with um, the use of lapinavir, ritonavir, remdesivir, a number of favipiravir, ribavirin. To date, uh, remdesivir is the only approved drug. And the others have not shown uh, tremendous efficacy at all. Um, the use of um, inhibitors of this cytokine storm, and indeed the use of JAK inhibitors, baricitinib, um, to, uh, to limit this inflammation, and dexamethasone also. What I want to remind you is that there are three phases of, of the disease. There's this early uh, viral response phase, uh, this pulmonary phase, and this, hype, this severe life-threatening hyperinflammatory phase. And you can see the viral plays really uh, is somewhat limited in terms of opportunities to block virus. So certainly remdesivir has utility over um, the whole viral response phase. Um, interferon, interferon alphas and interferon beta at the same time, it's really important that they be used during the viral response phase because we want to knock down the virus. And the JAK inhibitors and dexamethasone have utility later on in the disease. And it's important to appreciate that one would not look at using these early on in infection. For the JAK inhibitors, this is going to block any residual uh, interferon response. If you block the JAKs, you absolutely limit an interferon response or indeed a number of other cytokines. And dexamethasone, which is an immune suppressant, um, that allows for the virus to absolutely take off. So one should be very cognizant of the timing of the particular therapeutic intervention. 
based on our SARS-CoV-1 studies and all the data that were emerging about this virus and its ability to block an interferon response, we decided to, at the very start of the outbreak, undertake an exploratory study in uh, Wuhan, China, one of the hospitals, Union Hospitals. And what we did was we, we uh, recruited 77 uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive hospitalized cases that were treated either with nebulized interferon alpha 2b, five million units twice daily, Arbidol, which is a broad spectrum antiviral and that was pretty much standard of care across the hospitals uh, in Wuhan, 200 milligram tablets three times a day, or a combination of interferon plus Arbidol. All these patients um, throughout their time in hospital uh, had throat swabs for PCR uh, confirmation of viral presence. Uh, they had CT scans looking at their chests. We monitored temperature, oxygen sats, and a number of uh, blood biochemistry parameters, as well as cell counts and cytokine levels. Of note, no patient exhibited signs or symptoms of end organ dysfunction, and no patient developed respiratory distress requiring prolonged oxygen supplementation or mechanical ventilation. What I'm showing you here is um, a chest X-ray um, of a 68-year-old woman with fever, worsening shortness of breath. Uh, RT-PCR swab was positive three days prior, and this is actually somebody from um, Toronto. And the chest X-ray findings in common with SARS-CoV-1 show peripheral airspace consolidation uh, in both the upper and lower lobes. So in our patient cohort, what I want to draw your attention to is that we did not see this prolonged spike in fever um, that we had anticipated. So you can see that um, uh, patients, you know, normal temperature is 98.6 and the maximum we got was uh, in a handful of patients, uh, 99. So we did not see these uh, symptomatic spikes in fever um, and also, uh, what to reiterate that this was a mild to moderate group of cases, we saw that their oxygen saturations for all the cases uh, was, was pretty good. If we uh, now look in this slide at a number of uh, biochemical parameters that were evaluated and the dotted lines show the upper limits of, um, of normal, you can see that yes, there were fluctuations in these levels amongst all the cases, whether or not they were treated with Arbidol, interferon alone, or interferon plus Arbidol, and that's the red um, plot. There were fluctuations, but they were all, generally speaking, when one considers from onset to symptoms, um, days from onset of symptoms, they all fell uh, within an acceptable range. And likewise, when we looked at blood cytokines and, and PCT levels, procalcitonin levels, among the various treatment groups, uh, identified here. Again, uh, there were some fluctuations, um, but nothing that uh, was uh, dramatically uh, out of the range of normal. Again, reinforcing that these were moderate cases of COVID-19. When we looked at peripheral blood cell populations amongst the various treatment groups, and again, the arrows shows you, the, uh, the, the dotted lines show you the normal ranges. You can see, yes, there were fluctuations, and some increases above normal from uh, onset of symptoms throughout the course of their disease, um, but nothing that was dramatically uh, indicative of, of, of problems. Certainly um, there's some areas in platelets uh, that uh, were noteworthy. However, um, what we did observe was that interferon treatment accelerated viral clearance. So in this left-hand panel, I show you the three different uh, plots associated with Arbidol treatment, interferon treatment, and Arbidol plus interferon. And in the right-hand plot, what I've done is I've consolidated the, all those uh, cases that received uh, interferon. And you can see that there is an accelerated viral clearance that is statistically significant. And when one considered, when we adjusted for comorbidities, for sex and for age, the effects of interferon treatment remain significant. 
When we looked uh, at that time for, uh, for the effects of interferon treatment on some known biomarkers of uh, inflammation, namely IL-6 and C-reactive protein, what we can see here is that for those individuals who did not receive interferon, there was that characteristic spike in um, circulating IL-6 levels. Um, yet those patients who received interferon treatment, their IL-6 levels remained um, very low. And this is, um, just a reminder, this is a, a log scale here. Similarly, with C-reactive protein, we saw that interferon treatment um, maintained, uh, ensured low levels of circulating C-reactive protein. And again, when we adjusted for comorbidities, sex and age, interferon treatment effects remain significant. Now, as I mentioned, this is a respiratory disease. So the, all the action at the outset of the disease is in the lungs. So um, we have gone on to look at lung abnormalities and the effects of interferon treatment on these lung abnormalities. So what I show you here is some representative CT images that are scored based on lung abnormalities. Um, so zero, there's no lung involvement. Um, each lung lobe is scored up to a level of five, with five is greater than 75% lung abnormality. And in this patient here, you can see this ground glass pattern, um, which gives a CT score of seven. Um, in this individual, there's a considerable consolidation, a CT score of 11, and this is quite profound in, in both of these lobes, are giving a CT score of 16. So what we did is we looked at those cases that were treated with Arbidol alone or those that were treated with interferon, either with or without Arbidol. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is that prior to treatment, there really was no difference in the CT scores of all the cases that we looked at. And indeed on day one of treatment, when one wouldn't expect to see any change in the lung abnormalities, we also see no difference uh, here. However, over the course of treatment, what I hope you will appreciate is that those patients who received interferon, their CT scores, their lung abnormalities remained low, whereas those that did not, they had worsening lung abnormalities and the, the p-values are quite significant. In fact, if one looked at the maximum CT score, the final CT score or the percent change, uh, I hope you'll appreciate that interferon treatment limits and accelerates resolution of these lung abnormalities. What we then went on to do was to see if we could find clinical uh, parameters that were predictive of CT scores or worsening lung abnormalities. So independent of treatment, we took um, all the uh, patient values, and we looked, for example, at, as, I've list, as I've shown you here, at a number of potential correlates. So, for example, we uh, know that CD8 positive T levels, uh, T cell circulating levels um, here are highly predictive of um, whether the disease will progress. So, if you have a, a good CD8 uh, levels, now you have low CT scores, but lower CD8 levels, worse CT scores. Like, like, likewise, we know that platelet dysregulation uh, leads to increased coagulation um, and severe disease. So low platelet numbers, lower CT scores, higher platelet numbers, higher CT scores. And the two uh, biomarkers of inflammation, IL-6 and CRP, again, low levels, low lung abnormalities, worsening scores, uh, higher uh, worsening levels, uh, higher CT scores. The question then is what are the interferon effects on clinical parameters that affect these CT scores? So we looked at, uh, we only considered those circulating or clinical parameters where prior to onset of treatment there was no difference amongst all the cases whether or not they received interferon treatment and I show you here for CD8 levels Whereas in the absence of interferon treatment, um, we can see that those CD8 levels uh, remain relatively low. Interferon treatment absolutely increases, recruits, um, uh, activates uh, CD8 positive T cells. 
Likewise with IL-6, when one considers prior to treatment, no difference, and yet uh, on interferon treatment, we fail to see this spike in, in IL-6. And finally, uh, when one looks at another pro-inflammatory indicator, TNF, once again, we see that um, interferon treatment will suppress the activation of those uh, TNF levels. So one of the major issues associated with interferon has been that there's going to, it's going to invoke a cytokine storm. And what I hope these data have shown you that far from that, whether we looked at SARS-CoV-1, I didn't show you the data, or SARS-CoV-2, if you treat during the viral phase, you do not invoke a cytokine storm. And if anything, you limit that inflammatory response. So in summary, in summary, um, cognizant of the limitations that this was a very small cohort, it was non-randomized and the treatment arms were of unequal size. Our data uh, provided evidence that interferon treatment accelerated viral clearance and limited lung abnormalities. It reduced IL-6 and CRP levels. Age, comorbidities and sex did not negate the interferon effects. And these findings uh, are the basis for ongoing randomized controlled trials. So I would like to suggest that, uh, as I've mentioned, type 1 interferons are active on all cell types. They're effective against all viruses, and we should be considering them for the treatment of acute virus infections, where I hope I've demonstrated to some extent that there was no cytokine storm and we didn't see uh, severe adverse events. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge all those who convinced contributed to the SARS-CoV-1 study and the SARS-CoV-2 studies and uh, open up. I'm, I'm uh, receptive to any questions you may have. Thank you. Dr. Fish, thank you so much. This is really interesting and a little bit different from, from previous presentations we've seen. This is the first interferon kind of focused one. So thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions. If you can keep your slides up just in case the attendees have specific data questions, that would be great. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. And guys, please remember to send your questions in the Q&A function so that I can ask them to Dr. Fish. Okay. First question. In the Wuhan clinical trial, was treatment randomly allocated? And if not, how were treatments assigned? So um, it was randomly allocated, um, but as I mentioned, it wasn't a randomized control trial. And the, the allocation was uh, based on the f attending physicians. So um, they made the decision whether to treat with interferon or not. Mm. Okay. And um, a question, what is Arbidol and how is IFN administered? So dose and frequency, if you can comment on that, please. Okay. So Arbidol is a broad spectrum antiviral. It's, it's been in use. It's a tablet. It's been used for many years. Um, I think all the emerging data, certainly against SARS-CoV-2, is that it's pretty ineffective. So um, to our advantage, it's actually, for me, it, 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 we compare it to an ineffective therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the question? It was, it was to, uh, twice daily, um, no, three times daily, I think it was. So let's just go back to that slide. Um, I've got it in front of me, just bear with me, and I will tell you exactly what the dosing, um, here we go. Um, so it was 200 milligram tablets uh, three times a day. And uh, the interferon we used, it was nebulized. So you take a solution of interferon alpha 2b, 5 million international units, you nebulize it, and then you use a face mask to uh, inhale the interferon. Okay. And it was twice and daily, we did that. Twice daily. Were patients treated on the same day post diagnosis, diagnosis of the infection or post infection? Good no, question. that's that's uh, that's a very good question. So, um, so that you'll appreciate and it's much the same here that somebody has symptoms, they then go to get tested for COVID, and uh, post confirmation, um, they might start a treatment. Uh, in certainly in Canada, in the U.S., this doesn't happen until they arrive in hospital. Mm -hmm. In Wuhan, as soon as somebody had a positive PCR they were immediately admitted to either one of the hospitals or one of the temporary shelters uh, and started treatment. Hmm. So the time between PCR and treatment start was, was very short. 
the time between onset of symptoms to start of treatment varied. And we, we've adjusted for all of that. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, let's see, a couple of questions on CT scores. Did the CD4 T cell percentage also associate with CT scores? Uh, we're, we're examining that right now, but the most profound one was actually the CD8. And let's, let's just go and have a look at that again, look mm -hmm. at that slide. I don't think I've shown the one there which has um, CD4s. Let me just put it up. I don't think we've got that one. Um, no. So, uh, yeah. So uh, I haven't got that here and we're, we're, we're evaluating that right now. These are the ones that were the most significant, obviously. Okay. Great. Um, I don't know that I know this acronym. Why is interferon administered only BID? What is BID? I'm sorry, what, can you say that again? Why is interferon administered only BID? Um, if that person could just clarify what BID stands for. Uh, B is, it's twice daily. Um, you know, we, we, this was the, so if anything, the question should be asked, why was it interferon yeah. is twice daily as opposed to one daily? And the reason is that the, you know, when, the, when I was shown how they were going to use, how they were going to use an inhaled interferon. So again, I just want to say that an inhaled interferon in a respiratory infection is absolutely appropriate because you're targeting the airways and that's where the virus is. So I would argue this is the best option for treatment. The problem was that the system that was uh, available for us at that time, and this was at the very start of the outbreak, um, and the numbers were huge in Wuhan, was a mask system where you certainly covered the nose and the mouth, but a fair amount of the interferon got ingested. Hmm. So that's why we recommended twice daily. So even though we had 5 million international units that were being inhaled, um, we knew that a fair amount was being ingested. So coming in twice daily would ensure you got a better um, level of interferon in the airways. And indeed, in subsequent studies <laughs> where people have been looking at interferon around the globe and treatment options, it's usually 10 to 12 million international units per day. Um, hmm. I like to think that's based on our study, but, but who knows? Yeah. <laughs> so here's a question that seems fairly obvious after your statement that you just made. Is it available in the US? And if not, why? And okay. in other places Right now, well. there's, there's a huge study that I'm a part of um, that's being run by the NIAID called uh, ACT-3, where um, patients, and actually we've stopped recruitment now, we've got over nine, close to a thousand patients, where hospitalized patients were treated with uh, either remdesivir or remdesivir uh, plus interferon. And we're going to wait and see what the outcome is there. But so you have to do the clinical trial before you get approval. Um, my hesitation is that the outcome might not be that great because we were um, including patients who were in later stage of disease. And as sure. I mentioned to you, the interferon is really only going to have utility early on. So that's ongoing now, we'll have the results of that. The Synergen group in the UK used an inhaled interferon and their results are very promising. They just published those in Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Hmm. There have been a couple of publications from a Cuban group where they're using intramuscular and, and sub-Q injections with interferon, also very good results. And if I can just um, get your uh, patients for a moment, I'm going to show sure. you a study that we're just about to start, uh, hopefully tomorrow. Oh, um, great. Santiago, Chile, where as I, you know, I keep stressing, it's really important to catch individuals early on in their disease. Mm -hmm. So what we're actually doing is we're doing a post exposure um, trial. So we're going to go into households. So the first index case in a household, confirmed positive, uh, will be this is prior to hospitalization. As soon as they get a TCR positive, within 72 hours of symptom onset, they will be started on interferon treatment. At the same time, all those eligible individuals between the ages of 18 and 80 in a household that have been exposed to this contact but a PCR negative will also receive interferon. Mm -hmm. Those that are ineligible, we're still going to monitor. So we're going to, at various times, post uh, onset of treatment, 
we're going to be sampling these individuals in their households to see one, if the index case that we've caught very early on, hopefully will clear virus quickly and will not go to hospital. Whether the treatment eligible post exposure contacts, whether or not they, this interferon treatment protects them from getting infected or if they get infected, whether it, uh, they get a reduced severe disease. Yeah. And whether severity. those that are ineligible, so the elderly, the very young pregnant women, by this protection that's got this treatment in the household, whether they avoid them getting infected. So wow. this whole trial is about um, preventing transmission. So I think yeah. this, is, this is a really promising trial. This is a really elegant study design too. It's nice, you kind of have controls at every possible measure. So that's really nice. Um, I was curious for, for the, the index cases, are you working with doctor's offices to try and identify, you know, the minute they have a positive PCR, you offer enrollment into this type of study? Yeah, so, so the, the Santiago, Santiago, the city of Santiago in Chile has a, a you know, a central, as soon as the a PCR is positive, there's a centralized registry. Mm -hmm. So we are working with that centralized <clears throat> registry um, and that records, you know, the names, the addresses, the ages, of every individual. So we'll have all that information and then be able to contact the households, get their consent and proceed. What a great solution that we could be doing in the US, but we're not. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, this is a yeah. randomized controlled trial. And the beauty of it is, as you can see, by day 11, um, which we know that in the context of uh, infecting somebody, you have a, this, this window uh, mm -hmm. when they're infectable. So, Within 11 days, we're going to know whether these, uh, these household contacts have become infected or not. So we're going to have a result mm -hmm. uh, very, very quickly. So in contrast to the standard trials that go out to you know, 29, 30 days, uh, we'll start to see um, whether this is having any efficacy fairly quickly. Okay, because so you think it's about 11 days between when they might become infected? So the, these are the three times we dose them. So they're getting three doses in total. It's okay. Pegylate, pegylated interferon, so three doses. But my point is the index case, if somebody's going to get infected in the household, it's going to be within five to seven days of exposure, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to see very quickly, yeah. day 16 at the latest, whether we're getting transmission. That's a great study design. Um, a couple of questions now on this new trial. What defines ineligible for treatment? It seems like you've got an age cutoff and pregnancy. Uh, Age is an obvious one. Um, young children and very senior adults we're, we're concerned about. Um, mm -hmm. That's usually in clinical trials, your cutoffs. Pregnant women, that's a cutoff. Also, if somebody has a uh, comorbidity that has been demonstrated with interference, because they've been clinically approved for decades, mm -hmm. you know, Pepsi, for multiple sclerosis, we know what individuals are contraindicated. So mm -hmm. if they have certain kidney abnormalities, liver abnormalities. Great. And in this study, how will the INF be administered? Is it the same nebulizer they were using in the other yeah, study? We're, for this particular study, we're using uh, interferon. It's going to be a subcutaneous injection. As I said, this is a, a pegylated interferon. So we have high circulating serum levels for five, up to five days. So that's the three doses. Um, but um, there it has been interest from, as I've said, you know, the UK group, um, are interested in um, following up on this trial uh, using coming to Santiago and using their uh, inhaled interference. So mm -hmm. great on the list. Okay, I think this refers back to the other study. Um, have you immunoprofiled the patients in more detail during the treatment to see what subsets of CD4 and CD8 T cells are more prominent on the IFN treatment? Uh, no, that's uh, all ongoing. Um, yeah. The challenge here was, first of all, the challenge is that this is in China. So for me to get, mm -hmm. uh, I can't get any samples. That's that's a no-go. Um, right, okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a standard hospital. It's not a teaching hospital. It's not a research hospital. So there is a limit to what they were able to do in their clinical labs. Um, so we're still exploring if we can get some other analysis done, but it might 
my gut feeling is what we've got is what we've got. Yeah, sure. Um, the difference is in the ACT-3 trial in the U.S., we're going to have a lot more data analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think that probably knocks out this next question. <laughs> if you've looked at the antigen specificity of T-cells that arise, so anti-spike right. or other anti-CoV-2 yeah. recognition. So again, I'm in control of the Santiago trial, where we, if I tell you the, the extent of the analysis that we're going to yeah. do on peripheral blood, it's, it's huge. Great. We're going to tease out um, a huge amount of data from this very well-controlled trial, um, utilizing collaborations with some, uh, some stellar scientists all around the globe in terms of um, transcriptomics, in terms of looking at their immunophenotype, um, so just be patient. Yeah, definitely. That's a, a running theme in a lot of these analyses. Um, a question about, I'm not familiar with this one, uh, the Synergen company in the UK. How does interferon alpha compare with the beta version as used by Synergen in the UK? Are you familiar with this? Uh, so the reality is, and I, I, if you can cast your mind back to that first, one of the first slides I showed you where the interferon alphas and, and interferon beta uh, bind to uh, a receptor. Um, the, the reality here is that um, they all bind, both the, all the interferon alphas and interferon beta bind to the same cell surface receptor complex. Mm -hmm. There is a subtle difference in how um, interferon beta interacts with this receptor compared with the interferon alphas. Interferon beta has a more sustained um, binding compared to with interferon alphas. And yet, in all the studies we have done in my group over many years, one can get exactly the same signaling output. So um, if you dose appropriately, the outcome is identical. Hmm. And, Interesting. Um, so I, I I hear, you know, why did we, why did the WHO recommend interferon beta and not interferon alpha? Um, there's no difference. The reality is we have way more experience with interferon alphas in mm -hmm. terms of viral infections. So clinically, it would have been more appropriate yeah. to go with interferon alphas because if there would have been severe adverse events, we'd know how to treat them. You'd know what to do. Yeah, yeah. sure. So, uh, but it, in answer to the question, um, I don't think it makes a difference. And it's going to be availability right now. Interferon beta is being used for MS. So mm -hmm. there are a number of companies that have uh, stocks available. The interferon alphas, because of their failure or because of the Gilead direct antivirals, no longer used for hep C. So production and manufacturing has been cut back dramatically. Oh, wow. Um, That's interesting. So in actual fact, availability uh, may determine what, what ends up being used. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and how long is the half-life of interferon alpha one? Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, the half-life is about 20 minutes. So, so with the pegylated mm -hmm. interferon, so you, you have to daily dose, you know, um, mm -hmm. with the pegylated um, interferons, uh, you know, I didn't show you the data in healthy adults, you can show that you can maintain good serum levels that will invoke an in antiviral response for, uh, you know, for the doses we, we're planning to use for up to five days. And that's why we've got five days. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, um, a question on the Lancet paper. The inhaled results published in Lancet appear to be very promising. Is a similar trial likely to be conducted in the US using this drug or this method of application? Well, as I've said, I, I've been a strong advocate that for, for respiratory diseases, whether it be coronaviruses or influenza viruses, the, the smartest approach would be to target the respiratory tract. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you can shut down the virus there, you're not going to get spread. And also, if you, 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 you provide a, a good dose to the lungs, you're going to uh, limit viral replication and hopefully get viral clearance mm -hmm. before you get that inflammatory response. So. Unfortunately, the ACT3 trial is with a subcutaneous injection of interferon. Hmm. Uh, that doesn't mean we might not see positive results. Um, similarly, with our um, post-exposure trial, you know, we want to get this up and running as soon as possible, and yeah. we're using a sub-Q injection. Um, I'm in discussion with various groups to see if we can develop the kinds of inhalers that you use for asthma that yeah. you be able to do this in the community rather than in hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the plan moving forward. I think the utility will be for respiratory diseases that we use an inhaled form. Mm -hmm. 
it would be interesting in that case to, to work with maybe pharmacists and, and community point of care type testing where you could provide it really rapidly once they've had that test. That would be, yeah, that sounds really innovative. Um, so a question now on the efficacy of interferon. It's seen at the early stage, it looks like it's preventing viral replica replication um, and the early stages of contracting the disease. Is there any efficacy on some of the post effects of the disease, like the effects of the organs, lung damage repair? Um, it's sort of too early to know, I would think. Yeah, and, and I, you know, the reality is in some, you know, there have been some publications which show that, you know, later on in the inflammatory, the hyper inflammatory, that a severe stage of the disease, there are good levels of interferons and yet they're, they're not making anything better. So, you know, one might argue that once that infection becomes systemic, you actually don't want to be treating with interferon because then you might indeed be promoting mm. chemokines that will invoke a, a cytokine storm. So I, I, so there's a rate limiter, there's a certain cutoff point where I, you actually I, wouldn't apply that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's contraindicated to use interferon late in disease. I mean, mm. I think this, okay that's if data are going to emerge. And late in the disease, time-wise, or just based on symptomatic presentation, like if someone... So in, most, in this disease, they're very, they're ordinal. So, you know, if you come in with, uh, you know, just mild symptoms, it might be ordinal one, ordinal two. Once you start requiring continuous flow oxygen, then into mechanical ventilation, then into a hyperinflammatory stage, they've all got, they've been classified and characterized based into ordinal. So I would say beyond ordinal five, uh, once somebody's in the ICU and ventilated, it's absolutely not appropriate. Okay. Dexamethasone is the treatment of choice at that point. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, we're just about at the end of our time. Any final thoughts or, or comments you'd like to leave with the group before we wrap up? Uh, no, just thank you again <laughs> for uh, having the opportunity to share our results and hopefully get uh, uh, folks optimistic that there will be yet another treatment hopefully coming down uh, that will uh, complement the utility of vaccines. Yeah, we really need a suite of approaches and this seems like a really promising one. So that's really exciting. Thank you so much, Dr. Frisch, for sharing your insight with us and this exciting data. It's, it's great to see. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Okay. And thanks to everyone for joining and asking questions. These live meetings are really interactive and we really appreciate your engagement. So thank you for joining and asking your questions. I invite you to join us two weeks from today on the next Global COVID Lab Meeting, which is scheduled on the 3rd of December. Our next speaker will be Dr. Dara Duffy from the Institute Pasteur, who will talk about immune variability to infection with SARS-CoV-2. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please sign up for the HVP COVID Report. In this newsletter, we present insights from experts all around the globe and highlight the latest scientific articles and data. And finally, please feel free to visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn. We'll post a recording of this presentation there for you to review. And with that, I'll say thank you again for joining, stay safe, and we hope you'll join us again in two weeks on the next Global COVID Lab Meeting. Thanks everybody.